A very, very good evening uh, to all of you. And thanks for being, thank you for being with us on our channel. <clears throat> a very important discussion today. We are privileged to have with us senior advocate, Mr. Prashant Bhushan of the Supreme Court. And the reason we are having this conversation today is to discuss a pretty momentous issue related to fundamental freedoms. Three judgments that were today uh, uh, came out of the Delhi High Court, uh, Justice uh, Siddharth Nudul and Justice Anil Bambani's judgments in the cases of three extremely uh, fiery student activists, Asif, uh, uh, Iqbal, uh, Asif Tana Iqbal, Devangana Kalita and Natasha Narwal. We are going to be discussing the significance of these three judgments because they involved uh, draconian uh, application of the uh, law of UAPA, which has been used increasingly to squash dissent and to, of course, deny the right to get bail for many, many young persons all over the country, many academics, many lawyers all over the country, like in the Bhima Kode campus. Thank you very, very much, Prashant, for having this conversation with us. As we were saying earlier, could you just tell us the significance, the significance, legal and otherwise, of these three judgments that were passed by the Delhi High Court? Yeah, no, I think uh, the judgments today in uh, these three cases uh, are extremely significant because <clears throat> they lay down uh, how uh, the court should look at uh, charges under UAPA, that merely because the UAPA or sections of the UAPA are mentioned in the charge sheet, uh, does not necessarily make it out to be a, a case of an offense under UAPA. They say that for, for it to be an offense under UAPA, it has to be akin to a terrorist act and it has to be construed accordingly. And uh, the kind of charges that have been made against these three activists and many others also in the Delhi riots case are that uh, they were uh, organized in CA protests, that they were going to, they were planning to protest when President Trump was there and thereby spoil our relations with uh, the US, et cetera, or our international image, that uh, they were <clears throat> uh, giving some uh, inflammatory speeches or some rousing speeches, that uh, they, were, uh, <clears throat> they were going or they were planning some chakka jam. And therefore, it amounts to a conspiracy to trigger the riots in Delhi. That was, in essence, what the charge sheet says against these people and against many others. Now, the Delhi High Court has said that none of these acts, uh, that is giving uh, some rousing speeches, uh, planning some demonstration before President Trump, uh, or <laughs> doing any chakka jam, etc., that none of these either singly or collectively amount to any terrorist act because these people are not accused of being involved in any violence. Uh, they are not accused. Uh, uh, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that uh, they were uh, planning any riots, etc. This is a kind of uh, leap of uh, faith uh, that is that the Delhi police was trying to make that merely because they were protesting or that they were organizing uh, chakka jams, etc. Therefore, it amounts to a conspiracy to trigger riots. And therefore, they said that this is not a case under UAPA. Now, if it was a case under UAPA, if it was an actual case under UAPA, then the provisions for bail are very stringent. It says that the court has to come to some kind of a conclusion that there is not even a prima facie case against the accused, and which is very difficult for any court to say before even the trial has begun, before any evidence has been led, etc., or any evidence has been examined. So uh, that is why people under accused under UAPA are not being generally given bail. And uh, in this, they said that, uh, so we will have to treat it as a uh, normal criminal case and apply the principles of uh, normal and regular bail to this case also. And those principles are that unless there are 
reasons to believe that the accused will flee and not be available for trial or that the <clears throat> accused is going to tamper with evidence. Until then, uh, bail is the rule and jail is the exception. And therefore, they have been granted bail. And the significance of this case is that it will have, and it should have, a far-reaching impact on various other uh, similar cases against similar activists uh, that have also been filed and who are also languishing in jail, uh, being denied bail till now. Hopefully, they will also now be enlarged on bail. Thank you, Prashant. So we are basically saying is that by making a very reasoned argument that the any offense under UAPA should be treated as the exception and not like a normal offense under criminal law, by defining these as these such offenses extremely sharply and extremely narrowly, so that there is less scope for misuse by the agencies. And most important, like you yourself said, that upholding Article 191B of the Constitution, where the right to protest, the right to collectively protest, the right to creatively protest, even if it's a noisy protest, remains a very fundamental freedom, which would be very dangerous for any democracy to deny. So uh, Article 15, 17, and uh, 18 of the UAPA, 15 deals with what is a terrorist act, 17 deals with punishment for raising funds for such acts, and 18 deals with the so-called conspiracy under UAPA. All of these been, in a sense, been read down, and this has been seen to be kind of regular uh, kind of activity, which if at all any laws were broken in terms of the normal 144 laws, it would be a normal criminal offense where bail should be given. Uh, Prashant, what I wanted to ask is that the jurisprudence on UAPA, we saw a spate of uh, uh, judgments arising out of the Kabir Kalamanch cases initially uh, uh, before 2019, where you actually had also the reading down of certain provisions of the, of the statute, which is a pretty draconian statute, we'll come to that later, where the freedom of speech and freedom of expression uh, 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 were uh, upheld and membership was sort of read, also read down under the act to mean active membership and whenever it led to violence. That was the Kabir Kalamanj case. Then after that, you had the Vatali case and then you had the Najib case in 2021. Now, obviously, this particular um, batch of judgments vis-a-vis -vis the Delhi conspiracy, quote-unquote conspiracy riot, Delhi riots cases, is going to make a huge difference, like you said, to other uh, activists who have been similarly incarcerated uh, under, uh, under UAPA. What does it mean in terms of the lower courts being made to understand how they should be relating and treating charge sheets under so-called counter-terror uh, laws and terrorism cases? Because we often find that in, in, in such cases, there's an overwhelming feeling among the lower courts and the lower judiciary that if it is this kind of case, one needs to go with the prosecuting agency and not question the basis for such in many cases, manufactured cases. Yes, so the lower courts need to understand uh, that uh, when deciding bail, they also have to see whether the case or the charges or the allegations made against the accused actually amount to offenses under UAPA or uh, amount to a terrorist offense under UAPA. Because uh, merely because the section sections of UAPA have been applied in the charge sheet does not make it out to be a case which should be under UAPA. That's what this uh, High Court says. And therefore, it is the duty of every judge, every magistrate, while considering bail, to see whether any case under UAPA has been made out at all or not, whether the allegations or the charges really amount to charges of terrorism or such like as in the sort of reading down of these uh, sections of UAPA which the High Court has done. They have construed them narrowly and read them down and said that you have to see whether the acts alleged really amount to terrorist acts uh, before, before dealing with bail under UAPA. Because as I said, in UAPA, the bail provision is a very stringent one. In my view, that provision is unconstitutional. Unfortunately, the validity of UAPA had been upheld earlier by the Supreme Court. But in my view, 
it needs to be revisited and this particular section especially the section on bail needs to be struck down because how can you say that uh, you can't grant bail unless you arrive at a finding that there is not even a prima facie case against the accused and unfortunately this is why all these bhima koregaon activists uh, some of the finest activists in the country are still languishing in jail because of uh, this kind of provision for bail and because of uh, the kind of very stringent view that courts have been taking uh, in uh, bail under UAPA but i hope that at least uh, on the issue of whether because what the delhi police did in this case was really uh, quite laughable and ridiculous on the one hand they have charged some of our finest peaceful young activists who were involved in very peaceful anti ca protests under uapa for conspiracy to incite riots in delhi on the other hand they have let go people like kapil mishra anurag thakur etc who were seen on video clearly inciting violence and inciting the riots and they have let go uh, people uh, within the police itself who were beating up uh, innocent people to death uh, forcing them to chant jai shri ram or uh, uh, police officers who were seen breaking cctv cameras etc so therefore the delhi police investigation in the delhi riots case is in my view a conspiracy to frame innocent people and let off Uh, the real culprits who were close to this government in the guise of an investigation into a conspiracy and it was all kind of it all took shape during the first suddenly declared lockdown when people could not protest when people could not come out and that's when the charge sheet for hurriedly filed between march 22nd last year and june last year and all these people were arrested coming to the very important point that you made prashant about uh striking down section 43d5 of the uapa relating to uh, the stringent provision relating to bail uh, could could you could you uh, elaborate that a bit further because uh, we we have a 1960s law 1967 68 law uh, into which from 2004 2008 2014 and 2019 certain aspects of the uh, um, anti terror laws of pota and tada have been actually incorporated within amend, amendments made which means that in, in normal criminal law now you have some very very stringent provisions at work making it possible for uh, agencies to misuse why, why do you feel aspects of the uapa are unconstitutional and need to be struck down well you see article 21 gives us the right uh, of uh, liberty Uh, and that right of liberty can only be taken away uh, by a reasonable uh, process of law now in my view any law which says that uh, merely because you have been charged by any uh, investigative agency of even a serious offense that you cannot get bail uh, unless the trial court records a finding that there is not even a prima facie case against you such a provision is not a reasonable restriction of my liberty and therefore in my view it falls foul of article 21 it should have been struck down as violative of article 21 of the constitution because uh, <laughs> it's very easy as the police have done in the bhima koregaon case to make out any kind of absurd case on the basis of either fabricated documents as they have done uh, that uh, they infiltrated the computers of some of these activists hacked into their computers inserted some emails suggesting that they were conspiring to murder the prime minister and so on some absurd thing like that or even making an absurd allegation that uh, uh, suppose they produce one uh, witness in a 161 statement along with the charge sheet uh, who says that no i saw this person or i heard this person planning to 
put up a bomb here or a bomb there, etc. Now, merely because that has been uh, said in the charge sheet, does not mean that bail will be denied till such time that the uh, trial court comes to the conclusion that there is not even a prima facie case. If on the if on the face of it, it is clear that uh, some of the charges are absurd or uh, so totally uh, untenable or so totally unlikely that uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, that the judge feels that uh, uh, there is no reason that here is a very respectable person. There is no chance of his fleeing uh, uh, from, uh, from the trial. There is no question of his or her uh, tampering with evidence. The, uh, and therefore, there is no reason to deny him bail just because the uh, uh, prosecution has not even started the trial or they have cited 1,000 witnesses or they have filed a 10,000 page charge sheet as they have done in the Delhi riots case or the Bhima Koregao cases. So therefore, uh, to my mind, such a provision, uh, such a stringent provision for bail, which makes it virtually impossible for anybody charged under UAPA to get bail, is uh, is a violation of Article 21. Thanks, Pushan. And like coming back to this particular case, these particular cases where, like you said, three out of 22 of the activists who've been incarcerated are now hopefully going to get bail, and they've they've got bail, but hopefully they'll be free in a day or two. Uh, once the sureties are accepted, etc. Coming back to this so-called uh, conspiracy um, in the Delhi riots cases, which was clearly fabricated politically under the uh, by the Delhi police, where hate speeches and hate crimes committed by persons belonging to the ruling party and close to the ruling dispensation have been completely ignored and gone uninvestigated. The significance of these judgments vis-a-vis -vis the right to protest and the right to peacefully protest, whether it is Natasha's Narwal's case, or whether it is Asirik Baltana's case, or Devangana Kalita's case, the judges have independently held that, you know, even if they went ahead and made arousing speeches, organized, organized uh, chakka jams, like you said, etc., uh, such actions are not uncommon when there is widespread opposition to governmental or parliamentary actions. Now, this is very significant because if we narrow down our discussion now to this particular case, and if we look at Delhi of 2019 and uh, December, Jan 2020 and Feb 2020 and all India at that time, the country was completely uh, inspired by the protests that, were, that broke out in Delhi. In fact, the first one was at Jamia, in the gates of Jamia Milia Islamia on December 13th. We saw the, this law, completely anti-constitutional amendment being passed on December 9th and 11th, and we saw the first protest at Jamia, and then of course at other universities, Chiang Bagh, etc. But what is the significance of these judgments vis-a-vis -vis the democratic right to protest? Because increasingly we've seen executive actions trying to deny that protest. In many cases, 144 is uh, kind of uh, constantly applied everywhere. But we find also courts taking an extremely conservative view on protest. Now we suddenly see that space also opening up with these three judgments. Yeah, you see uh, that there is a right to protest, there is a right to noisy protest, there is a right to chakka jam also uh, under the constitution. Uh, meaning ki, yes, you can be, uh, if there is Article 144 in place and rightfully Article 144 in place, then you can be charged for violating 144. But you cannot say that a protest, even a noisy protest or a plan to have chakka jam amounts to a terrorist act or an act under uh, uh, any other section of the penal code, et cetera, because that's known that that's part of your Article 19 rights under the Constitution. In any democracy, the people have a right to protest, have a right to noisily protest, have a right to give rousing speeches against the government, et cetera. That, is, that has always been accepted to be a fundamental right. Unfortunately, you see, in the last few years, we had been seeing the specter of uh, courts kind of uh, 
especially lower courts and sometimes even the higher courts buckling down to a view which was the kind of uh, establishmentarian view that uh, we can charge people who have been protesting also under UAPA by saying that they are involved in some kind of a conspiracy to instigate riots, et cetera, which is what the police had done in the Delhi riots cases. And it was utterly absurd. And I'm glad that the High Court has said something which was so obvious and which, uh, which, uh, which should not have merited much discussion. But in, in the light of what has been happening in the recent past, uh, it's something which was required. And I'm glad that the High Court has said it uh, quite explicitly, uh, but something which in my view was quite obvious. If anybody understands uh, the significance of Article 19 rights under the Constitution. Finally, Krishan, I just wanted to come back to draconian laws like the UAPA. Because we've had in the past laws like CADA, MISA, before that, and POTA after that. And all these laws that were supposedly brought in for exceptional reasons, exceptional political circumstances, threat of terror, etc., had a couple of things in place which UAP has been which is that these, these laws are supposed to be there for a limited period of time when the quote unquote nation was facing a particular kind of threat. There was judicial scrutiny. You had the POTA review committees, you had the other judicial reviews simultaneously possible of these charge sheets that were filed under these laws. And therefore, it was possible at some point to have checks and balances. The UAP seems to have done away with that. What next in terms of the political class, the executive class, the opposition, not just civil society activists and not just human rights activists, not just human rights advocates and lawyers like you, basically making a demand for repealment of such documents? I think it's very, very important for there to be a, a sort of big voice, uh, both from the political class as well as from uh, civil society activists to repeal these draconian laws. Not only repeal these draconian laws, but also to reform these kind of agencies like NIA. I mean, the agencies which are supposed to be investigating these offenses have become a tool in the hands of the government to just harass and intimidate and incarcerate any inconvenient activists or uh, dissenter or even opposition leaders under this country. Uh, it's just become a tool. These laws coupled with the agencies which are implementing these laws, the investigative agencies. I mean, we've seen in the Delhi riots case, it's the Delhi police. But otherwise, it's the NIA, and the NIA is just a political tool. All these agencies, in fact, including the Enforcement Directorate, the Income Tax Department, uh, so many agencies have just become political tools of the government, even the CBI to a very large extent. So uh, uh, we, we need to not only repeal this law, but we need to reform all these investigative agencies also. The police reforms judgment in Prakash Singh's case is still languishing without uh, being implemented. Uh, the, uh, all these agencies, the NIA, the ED, et cetera, their, 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 uh, their directors should not be appointed by the government alone. Just as uh, election commissioners uh, and CAG, et cetera, should not be appointed by the government alone. These are very important agencies which have to be non-political and non-partisan. Uh, and therefore, uh, we need serious reforms in these agencies also. Thank you so much, Prashant, for joining us in this conversation. I'd just like to end up by saying, uh, concluding on a happy but somber note, that uh, on this day, June 15th, it is like 46 years, after the emergency was declared on you know, 25th of June, 1975, 300 days after Natasha, Asif, and Devangana were incarcerated, we still have, like Mr. Bhushan himself said, we still have at least 19 other activists in the Delhi riots case still in jail. We hope they will see freedom soon. There's a regret that Natasha could not meet her father before he passed away, when she should have been able to have, have the right if she had been on bail. We also know that in the Bhima Koregaon case, 
we know that Father Stan Swami and uh, Professor Hani Babu at the moment are undergoing treatment in hospitals in Mumbai. We also know that whether it is Sudha Bhardwaj, Shoma Sen, Doma Wilson, Subhendra Gadlin, Anand Tel Tumbe, Vernon Gonzalez, absolutely fine, upright activists and academics. They are still in extremely difficult and hygienic conditions in Taloja jail under the UAP in the Yuna Kurega case. There are also others who are less well known who also get incarcerated in, under such draconian laws, whether it is in Jammu and Kashmir, whether it is in Uttar Pradesh, whether it is in Gujarat under Pasa, or whether it is sometimes even in Chhattisgarh. So we need to constantly raise our voices uh, against the misuse of such draconian laws. Sometimes state laws are also draconianly misused. And therefore, we celebrate today as we must because the Delhi High Court has given us this excellent judgments to take our fight further, our collective fight further. And I think I'd just like to end by saying that, you know, the foundations of this nation are not so weak that the Delhi High Court said that they can be threatened or should be threatened or seem to be threatened by a few vibrant protests by some of our young activists who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. I'd also like to salute these youngsters who led these protests last year in this spontaneous and amazingly creative fashion. Prashant, if there's anything more to say, please do add uh, this. And thank you as always for always talking to Citizens for Justice and Peace. No, I just want to end by saying that uh, I think uh, some of our high courts have again, again begun doing the job that has been entrusted to them by the constitution. And to some extent, the Supreme Court has also again begun to do that job. And I hope that we will see this trend continue uh, in the judiciary of this country. The judiciary is a very important regulatory institution entrusted with a very important function. Uh, for some time, we saw them kind of lose direction, but now they seem to be regaining direction. Let's hope that trend continues. Thank you so much, Prashant, always for talking to us. And uh, very good luck in all the struggles that you face and the ones that you also lead. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Tista.